So this is the first time in Denmark doing the slides with the Lego. That's uh, really nice to be here. So I will talk about uh, how to put uh, retrospectives on steroids using Toyota Kara. Uh, how many of you in here do uh, regular retrospectives? How regular is that? Like uh, every month? Every two weeks? Every week? Every day? Multiple times a day? Hmm. Okay. So let's meet the, uh, hopefully, this is the Agile team. They've been doing Agile for quite some time. They regularly do their retrospectives uh, and uh, their ceremonies. They do uh, uh, things like pair programming, TDD, and uh, everything. But it seems like they are kind of becoming a little bit uh, stale. They're not really improving anymore. Uh, but um, they do their retrospectives. They look at what works good and what doesn't work so good. They collect ideas of uh, what is working, what is not working, uh, what they want to improve. Uh, and they create long lists of things that they can improve. But most of these suggestions of how to improve actually points in many different directions. So how do they know that they're actually improving or not? If we would think this as physics and we are moving in multiple directions with this equal force, what, where would we be? More or less in the same place. Maybe moving around a little bit depending on the forces, right? So this is... Many times I've seen in Agile teams that this is the case. We can collect a lot of stuff. Uh, we have many different suggestions on how to improve, but are we actually improving or not? A and many times I kind of come to the situation where you get to an improvement whack-a-mole, meaning that you are having lots of different suggestions, you try a lot of th different things, but the problem seems to just pop back up again and you have to whack it with another solution. Is this something that you kind of recognize? A few nods. So for me, I think uh, stop kind of collecting problems and start improving. This is really what we want to do. So who am I? Uh, I'm an agile coach at uh, a company called King. Uh, we do uh, different types of casual games uh, or games in general. Uh, we are present in... Uh, uh, a lot of countries, so here's some facts about King. Uh, we have developed more than 200 games. Uh, we uh, are present in more than 200 countries, and we have something like 340 million uh, average monthly unique users. Uh, and this is from Q2 2015. We are currently the global leader in cross-platform uh, casual gameplay. Uh, a few of the titles you might uh, recognize here, we have Candy Crush, Pet Rescue, Farm Heroes, and Bubble Witch. Something that you might not know is that uh, the company was actually founded in 2003. So uh, it's really not uh, a very new and a kind of a startup company anymore. We are present in Stockholm, which is the, uh, the first office, uh, London, Barcelona, uh, Malmö, just across uh, the waters here, uh, in Bucharest, Berlin, Singapore, and in Seattle. We were at least in end of Q2 this year. I think we were 1,500 people. And here's some uh, interesting other facts, uh, kind of mind-boggling kind of things. So we, on average, uh, we have 1.4 billion average game plays a day. That's quite a bit of game plays each day. How many of you play Candy Crush or Candy Crush Soda on a daily basis? 
Okay, I won't tell you, boss. <laughs> and this year we actually had the one trillion level played uh, in one of our games. Uh, and we kind of moved from uh, web-based games into Facebook games, and now we are also present on mobile. Uh, and some of the games we've seen before, but here are the few of the main titles that we have. Enough about King, and let's dive back into uh, Toyota Kara stuff. Uh, I've been doing this for quite some years. Uh, I think I was exposed to Kara maybe 2011 or 2010, and we met at uh, Meyerhofen and talked about this in 2012, I think. Uh, so I've been doing it for quite some time. Uh, I'm really a, a Toyota Kara geek. I think this is uh, just like uh, uh, Jesper said, something that I try to use on a daily basis, even if my the ones that I'm coaching is not really aware of it. Uh, I'm an avid circuit fan. I also like barbecue. Uh, and if you haven't guessed it yet, I'm a huge Lego fan. Uh, and just to make this super extra clear now when I'm here in Denmark, uh, Lego is a trademark of Lego Group, which does not sponsor, authorize, or endorse this presentation. I wish they were at least sponsoring me, but uh, that's another question. Maybe you can bring that back. Toyota Kara. So, how many of you know what a Kara is? Do we have any suggestion what a Kara would be? No? I think you raised your hand, or did I miss you? So something you repeat. Yeah, karate. Yeah. And why do you do it? So you do it, you repeat something, a pattern to learn it. Any other suggestions? To make it without thinking. Hmm? So, kara, I at least what I've learned, is really uh, comes from martial arts or uh, kind of Asian tradition of how to convey uh, knowledge between generations in different, for uh, in different uh, areas, and especially in martial arts. And it's that you create a set of movements that you repeat over and over, so it kind of becomes muscle memory. And when it's mus muscle memory, you don't have to think about it anymore. Uh, not the big kind of part of the movement, but you can start to hone in on the details and really think about the content of how you use it either in combat or uh, uh, when you do it to perform uh, uh, the katas for competition. Would that be an appropriate kind of description for the guys doing uh, martial arts? I see a few nods. So, a guy called Nonaka, who researched on uh, uh, how we convey information and knowledge sharing and so on, in his excellent book, uh, book uh, Managing Flow, he describes Kara as a synthesis of thought and behavior in skillful action. A metacognition of reflection in action. And what he describes the kata compared to uh, uh, a routine is that the kata itself, it might seem on the surface to be quite static, but internally, when you practice it a lot, it will actually change and adopt to the context that you do it. And uh, I think it was uh, this morning when the, uh, we had from Lego and uh, uh, Henrik, you talked about the shoe hurry. So this is the same kind of idea that we, at shoe level, we do, we follow a script, but as we learn, we can focus on the content uh, of what we're actually doing. And therefore, we can put all our efforts and all our focus on the content itself instead of the form. Anyone remember this movie? So basically, what he w uh, in Karate Kid, uh, this was the first version. I saw the second version with my son a few weeks ago. 
Uh, he didn't do this on a uh, on a car then, uh, but kind of wax on, wax off. He was practicing on polishing the car, but what he didn't realize was that he was actually building up a pattern of uh, blocking punches and uh, kicks. Uh, and what we really want to do with Toyota Kata is to kind of create uh, an organization muscle memory for continuous improvement. So we want to ingrain this as something that we will do without thinking uh, on a daily basis. And the Toyota Kata has two main parts. We have the improvement Kata uh, and we have the coaching Kata. Uh, today I will mostly focus on the improvement kata, that's the actual doing that would be the equivalent of uh, the retrospective. Uh, but in my point of view, as I've learned and kind of, um, kind of made this part of what I do, I actually think the, the coaching kata might be uh, an even more important part, which is to describe how a manager, a leader, a coach in your organization would behave on a daily basis to build the learning organization. But we will focus mostly on the improvement kata today. So what is the improvement kata? Well, the improvement kata has two kind of main phases. We have the planning phase and then we have the execution phase. And okay, so we're on an agile conference, uh, planning might planning and phase and the uh, execution phase and so on might not f seem so agile, but uh, bear with me. Uh, we will see uh, after the session what you think. So in the planning session, we start by trying to understand the direction. What are we trying to achieve? Where do we want to strive towards? So just like we had uh, Jesper's uh, presentation uh, just recently talking about creating the vision for a product or uh, a project. Here is the same. We focus it on how we do work more than on a product or a project, but it's how we can improve how we do work. So we really know what need to know where we're going. Then the second part is to truly understand how are things working right now. We know what we're aiming for, but we really not need to know where we are right now. Otherwise, how can we know what steps to take to try to strive towards uh, where we want to go? And then the last part of the planning phase is to set the next target condition. So this is kind of setting uh, the next sprint goal or maybe the next release goal. What do we want to achieve within a short time period? So understanding direction a little bit longer, setting uh, the next target condition might be the sprint goal or uh, the release goal. And then we come, we step into the execution phase. And here we try to iterate in small steps towards our target condition. That would be the next step that we have, the next target that we want to achieve. And then either when the time for when we should we're supposed to reach our target condition end of the sprint end of the uh, release if we have either reached it at that time or before then we exit out and we repeat so this is a pattern that you repeat over and over and it actually is something that you basically never stop you always try to strive for something better. In another play, kind of describing this, we have a vision. We need to understand where we are. Then we need to aim. And the vision might be something that we describe would be like uh, one year or in Toyota's case, they are kind of aiming 10 years into the future. That might be a little bit big elephant to grasp in one bite, right? So we want to set a challenge that is, is a little bit closer, and that maybe is half a year or a year out, uh, but it's still not something that you can achieve immediately. And it's typically set in a way that it is definitely outside of what you think that you can achieve, but you want to strive for it. And then we set a number of these target conditions until we move, come up to the challenge, and then we reset the challenge, and again. 
Okay, another example. A vision. We should boldly go where no brick has been before. To explore space and so on. Maybe, the, is this Mars? Maybe. So, the current condition, think of yourself stepping back in the beginning of the 1960s. Uh, we have rockets, uh, potentially they can lift off uh, without exploding and so on. Um, and then someone set a challenge. We choose to go to the moon and so on. Did they know at that point that they will actually achieve it? Probably not. It was really a bold challenge that they set out. They definitely didn't know how to reach it, uh, but they broke it down to small steps. And that would be target conditions. Yes, we need a rocket that could lift off. We need a rocket that can actually go out to space and maybe circulate Earth. We want to be able to do a spacewalk. And then eventually we ship, we send the rocket off and circle the moon, but not land. And then we have a target condition of actually landing on the moon itself and coming back. So this is kind of the idea of how the improvement kata itself is framed in another context. Then let's take a quick look at the coaching kata. And the coaching kata is supposed to uh, have the leaders coaching the learners. And a company that has implemented this fully, that means that every leader in the organization has a number of learners or uh, someone that reports to them that would do improvement work. So you have a, the leader is supposed to be the teacher or the coach for the rest in the organization working on improvements. And the coach or the leader should be someone that gives a helping hand, kind of help you drag up, uh, kind of learn and uh, grow as an individual. The leader should be help helping that out, but also be someone that kind of pushes you in the right direction. Well, if we are an agile company, maybe we shouldn't do uh, longer planning and bigger batches and so on. We actually want to have smaller batches and we want to have more of a continuous flow. And to do this, we can follow a coaching script that is uh, basically on this card and it could to kind of highlight what you go through and you go through this in every coaching session. And this card you can download from uh, Mike Rother's uh, website is to always kind of reiterate where is the ne what is the next target condition that we want to reach. And then what I how are things really working today? And then we ask ourselves, so what was the last step that we tried to do? What was the last experiment that we, want, uh, we were trying to achieve? And what did we expect by running that experiment? Or, or taking that step. And then comes the, the really important parts here in, uh, in the Toyota Kata and the coaching side of it is to what actually happened. So we should be able to really understand what happened. And now we get to the ex really exciting parts. That's why we're dimming the lights, right? What did you learn? So Toyota Kata is really an improvement Kata is really about how do we optimize for learning. It's not about necessarily achieving a certain uh, result, but what did we learn by trying to do this? And then we step back and we ask ourselves, what obstacles do we actually think now is preventing us from reaching our target condition? What is your next step? What experiment do you want to run? Here's a really important part. What do you expect will happen when we run it? And we define this before we run the experiment. And then we define when can we go and see what we have learned from taking that step. So for me, this coaching kata is really uh, what a true lean and agile leadership style is all about. 
if we go through a similar kind of pattern or following this in a shoe kind of level approach of how to do coaching in continuous improvement, it is really, really uh, what I have found to be a lean and agile leadership style. Okay, a story. So this is not from King, but from uh, another customer that I had uh, before I joined King. Uh, how we had an agile team that went from kind of a scooter to a race bike. Uh, and uh, they were doing kind of regular retrospectives, uh, but they didn't really see any great results. So not so fast. And they were not so motivated in terms of doing improvements on how they did work. And by introducing Toyota Kata, they became much faster and much, much more motivated in actually trying to uh, improve their way of working. So what were they actually then trying to do? Well, the problem was that they had a big kind of proprietary hardware that they loaded in their own proprietary software into and they wanted to try and see if that software worked in that hardware uh, as often as possible. Uh, this process might be familiar to some of you. This is called continuous integration and it's basically about trying to fit two pieces and if they fit it should be green and maybe we get a very nice green indicator that says, wow, it's actually working. Uh, or when you try to fit it together and it doesn't fit, you want to have a red signal or uh, some warning lights going off telling you that it's actually not working. So when it works, it, will, it should be green. When it doesn't work, it should be red. The problem in this company was that Quite a few times, we, when it actually was working, we got an indicati indicator that it was not working. And when we actually got it to work, sometimes it was indicating that it didn't work. So this we wanted to kind of avoid. So we sat down we started to uh, look at what do we actually want to achieve. And what we want to achieve is when it's green, when continuous integration works, and the software works in the hardware, we want it to be green. And when it's not working, it should be red. Sounds simple, right? Is this how you do continuous integration at your company? I see a few nods, okay. Yeah, but the problem is this, this was actually really hard in this case because there were loading it into uh, uh, the hardware and so on. It was easily that it could kind of fail on the way. So instead of aiming for this that we actually thought would take some time to actually do, uh, we aimed a little bit uh, easier, meaning that whenever something showed that it was not working, it should be turning red. But we couldn't guarantee every time it, it was green, according to our build, uh, it was actually working because that was a little bit out of uh, the control of this team and quite hard to do. So we put up this Toyota Kata board. Uh, we started to, to look at, so what's the actual condition right now? How is the, the build system actually working? And the team said, well, uh, we don't really know. A few in the organization is complaining that when they build something, sometimes it shows red and sometimes it shows green. So they had to actually find out how it was working. So they kind of stepped out of their protected environment and met the customers, started to look at how was it actually working. Uh, they went, uh, and as it's uh, ex often expressed in Lean, to go and see where the real action really happens. So they went there, they gathered data, and they came back. And what they could say, see is that about 70% uh, of the reds should actually be green, meaning that for some reason the build failed 
when the software was actually working. So of course that meant that no one really listened to the build system because uh, whenever they rebuilt, it could be that it was working or not. And they identified a lot of different problems or obstacles of why this was the case. But instead of trying to make a, a long uh, project plan of how they can actually achieve this, uh, we took the Toyota car approach and we focused on only one of the obstacles. And instead of saying we just want to attack an obstacle, instead we define how we wanted it to work when we have fixed the obstacles. So we set the target condition and we said of the 70% red that should actually be green, in a month's time we want 40% of the red to actually be green. They started to work, one problem at a time. We picked one, started to work. They met a week later and they worked a little bit more. And after a month, they only reduced from 65, sorry, from 70 to 65 percent. So they hadn't really achieved the target condition. But they worked on uh, quite a few of the obstacles. So why was this? Well, we'll take a look at that. The team really still didn't feel so fast or so motivated. But why? Well, in this case, the biggest obstacle right now for the team was that they were too busy to improve. They were just keeping everything running and couldn't really focus on the improvements. So what we really tried to do then was to address this point as the main obstacle. And in a lean and agile kind of fashion, when something is really not working, what is the first thing that you will try to do? Any suggestions? Yes? Try to learn from it, that's a good point. Uh, and how do you learn from it? The easiest way I found, in a very pragmatic way, in the lean and agile fashion, is to do one thing. It's to half the batch size. Always half the batch size, or double the frequency of the things that you do. So this would be your first gut response to almost any problem uh, when you're not improving enough. Why? Because if you practice it more, the more you can learn, the more opportunity that, that you have to, to actually learn from it. So instead of meeting once a week, we decided to meet every day. So we will work on the same thing, the same problems, but we will meet every day. That was the only thing we changed. We're still at 65, 60%, and we're taking one small step at a time. We came down to 55%, still not at 40. Team is a little bit more motivated. Well, it was still not really reaching the target. So what did we do? Well, we decided to actually meet. As soon as the task itself was done, we meet. Instead of once a day, we met multiple times a day. And in this case, it was kind of making the changes then even smaller, even something that you can do in a few hours instead of something that you, can, you need a whole day to fix. And what really happened then was that we could move even faster with the same amount of actual time spent on doing it uh, and moving much, much more faster towards the 40% goal. And uh, at this third attempt, we reached uh, the 40% goal. And the team, they were much more motivated. Uh, they improved much more than they did before. And basically, they moved from uh, a scooter to a race bike in terms of doing improvements uh, in this team. And they did this through smaller batches. We met very often. Instead of meeting once a week or every two weeks or whenever we have our uh, retrospectives, we met as soon as we could. 
minimal viable change. And we do them as fast as we can. And in the beginning, try to focus on some of the quick wins that you can do, even if you don't think that they will actually uh, be the main root cause. Sometimes fixing the small things will actually make the big problems go away. And of course, have fun. And this team, they felt, well, Toyota Kara rocks. So then let's just step back and kind of look a little bit more in detail of how the improvement Kara uh, works. So we have understanding the direction, grasp the current condition, set the next target condition, and then iterate towards the target condition. Understanding direction. We talked about it before. Setting a direction or a vision where we want to aim for is really, really crucial. If we don't know where we're aiming for, we can come up with a million different types of solutions, but we might not solve the problems that we need to solve. And as Bruce Lee said, a goal is not always meant to be reached. It, is oft it often serves simply as something to aim at. So if we put a goal far in the future, it's not necessarily that we actually need to achieve that goal because it's so far in the future. So we probably on the time when it takes to get there, we kind of have changed a little bit direction on the way. But it's something to aim for and everyone can rally around it. And when we talk about Toyota Kara, it's really about a process focus and not an outcome focus. So Toyota Kara itself is not focused on delivering a product or uh, a certain service or anything like that. It's about how we set up the system of work so we can achieve what we want to achieve. Getting a product out to the market or having a certain service level or whatever it can be. So when you talked about uh, SAFE this morning, uh, kind of describing what you want to achieve and having this cadence, uh, being able to do the replanning every eight weeks, is that the cadence that you use right now? Uh, gathering everyone together, be able to focus on doing that, that is a capability as of an organization to be able to change direction and have a true focus moving forward. And Toyota Kara is about setting up a system, helping you improve that system so that can happen all over again, uh, all the time. So it's not a business or a company vision. It's about how we want our processes to behave so we can achieve the business vision and the, uh, the, bis uh, the company vision. So how might this look like? If we would look to Toyota, uh, Toyota when they produce cars, uh, they would have something like this. I've never worked for Toyota myself, so this is only second or third hand information. Uh, but you will see something similar to this. Their vision for product operations is zero defects, 100% value add, that means that everything that you do in that process should add value to the customer. One piece flow in sequence on demand and security for people. Do you think Toyota is close to this? Anyone here has a Toyota? Are there zero defects? Any defects in your Toyotas? I see a few nods. So they are, to my understanding, they are very high on the, the short of uh, the number of defects, the low number of defects on cars. But they still have, I think it's a 100 defects per every 1,000 cars or something like that. So it's still not zero defects. Do you think that everything they do in the factories is 100% value added? No, not even close. Because if this is where the raw material is stored and the car on the line is over here, the movement from taking something up here and moving it into the car here is considered to be waste. 
So for Toyota, they are far from being uh, at this vision. And they've be only been working on it for 70 years. So how could this look like in software then? Well, uh, looking at the kind of long-term perspective for a software company, that might be zero defects. And in this case, I added in production because product development typically needs a certain amount of uh, exploratory before we actually go to production. Uh, so we can't have perfect quality the first time. Uh, zero percent, uh, hundred percent uh, value added, meaning that everything we do should add value to the uh, to the customer and the product, and maybe highest value first on demand. Would you, as a company, be able to do this today? The companies that I worked for and uh, for King were definitely not close to this but it's something to aim for. Grasping the current condition. So one of the things that you really want to do, as a leader especially, is to step out of your corner office. You need to go out where the work is done to go and see and find out how things really are at the Gemba. You can't sit and look at things in and a report or anything like that, because you don't learn all the subtle details what is actually happening. You need to get out there and find out how it actually works. And especially for us that is working with intangible things like software, typically what you want to do is to bring that intangible kind of thing and make it tangible. So visualizing your work, uh, making it physical can really help. Being a Lego fan, one of the things that I try to do sometimes is to actually make those visualizations in Lego, of course. And having people to actually move around Lego bricks instead of post-it notes can actually make it more fun. I see a few people kind of thinking, hmm, we have bricks, a lot of them. Maybe we should do that. So what do you want to collect? Well, you should try to collect data and facts, not gut feeling. But sometimes the only thing that we have is gut feeling. Well, then try to turn that gut feeling into data. So on a regular basis, collect your gut feeling uh, so it becomes data. It should be, uh, describe your process. How is your process actually working? How is the process actually behaving and what is the result of running your processes as a kind of a final gauge on if you're improving or not. So not diving too much in detail here, but what we really want to do is to focus on how the process itself work. So we want to not focus so much on what we actually deliver, but how we deliver. How long does it take to have uh, a finished build? How many times do we check into trunk? Yeah. How often do we pair program and so on? A lot of these things based on how we actually work, not on the outcome itself. That is much more important to measure to be able to improve your system than the actual outcome. Of course, we need the outcome to be able to have some gauge if we are improving or not but it's only the ga a gauge for if we are improving or not. It doesn't really tell us what to do to improve. And typically, if you look at lead time, throughput, and quality, would you say that they are decisions or something that tell you immediately if you change something, if you got a positive or uh, a negative result on it? These are typically lagging indicators. So lead time, for instance, if you change how often you deploy, it will take at least one deployment cycle until you have new lead times. You can't see them up front. So what you instead would like to measure is things like queue size, working process, and so on. Those are much more important than the actual outcome. And typically, this is something that we don't measure. We measure how the velocity and stuff like that. 
And that is only the result of how we do work, not uh, something that we can actually take action on. Then we have setting the target condition. And here comes kind of the, the coaching dialogue between the leaders and the people doing the actual work, uh, is to find what is a target condition that is uh, just right. And what we want to do here is to define a target condition that is just outside of our knowledge threshold, meaning that it's we don't necessarily know how to actually solve it, but it shouldn't be kind of something that we uh, have no idea how to do it. It should kind of feel like fitting a, a square peg in a round hole, because then you can push yourself, then you can kind of think outside the box. And when we set these target conditions, it should be an hypothesis on the journey towards your challenge and vision. It should be based on your business strategy or model for how to do process improvements. So if lean and agile is your thing, increasing the batch size is probably not a target condition you want to set if you don't want to prove a certain point. And then you should follow the Goldilocks rule. How many Swedes do we have in the, in the audience? Not so many. Lagom is a great word that we have in Sweden. Do you have that in Danish? The Goldilocks rule? It should be not too hard, not too easy. It should be just right. Sorry? OK. I will never try to pronounce that. But uh, that sounded good. In most other languages, especially uh, outside Scandinavia, they don't have this word. So the Goldilocks rule. And this is, of course, really, really hard. And that's why it's important to have a coach uh, or a mentor present all the time so you can kind of try together to find this. And when we set these target conditions, we have our current condition. We're kind of aiming towards the challenge. Do you think we will set the target conditions like this? Well, no, it's more like this. We have our current condition and we are aiming for something. But what we want to do is to just to take a step into the unknown. And when we are in that position, then we can kind of redirect the next step. So we only take one step in and see what happens. And many times the problems that we saw here, when we took the first step, a lot of them just disappeared. And we have a new set of fine problems that we can address instead. Some examples of uh, target conditions that I've used in the past might not be the perfect ones, but uh, it will kind of help you to think about that target conditions is really about the process, how we run the process. It's not delivering a certain number of uh, story points or uh, velocity and so on. That is kind of more on the output side. We want to shift it more to how do we actually work. And then we come to iterates toward the target condition. And this is, if we kind of skip the planning phase here, it's very easy to skip this and jump immediately into here. What you typically uh, find then is that you will have the same position as we had in the beginning. A lot of different actions moving in many different directions, but we are actually not moving anywhere. So what we really want to do is the planning phase first, and then we start to iterate. And when we take think about iterating, think of yourself being in the laboratory. You have the two vials, and you want to pull them to put them together. And what happens? Wow, I did not expect that. Hmm, what is that sound? That's the sound of learning. Because if we only do the things that we knew in advance, what would happen? We are just late implementing it. Experimentation is about trying not to throw mics on the floor. I did not expect that to happen. So I learned something. Don't put the mic on a very blank table. 
So what we really want to do, if we want to optimize this, uh, we want to place, put down a hypothesis when we, before we run, and there should be text in here. And let's see if we see anything. No. So it should say hypothesis, prediction, experiment, observation, and then we have the learning. Because if we don't write down before we run the experiment what we expect to happen, we are actually reducing our uh, ability to learn. Because the human brain has a dysfunction calling uh, confirmation bias, which means that if we don't write it down and write it down in details, after the fact we will say, well, I expected that to happen. And you are actually reducing your ability to learn. So if you want to optimize for learning and improving your system of work, go through the scientific approach of trying to phrase a uh, hypothesis, make the prediction what you think will happen, closely observe what happens when you run the experiment, and then look at the delta between what really happened and what you expected. And you should really try to set it up so something like 50% of the things that you do is not getting the result that you were expecting. So in, in information theory, this is kind of the optimal way you can learn uh, as much as possible but still have a result. So, Toyota Kara, for me, it is really about creating an organizational muscle memory uh, for continuous improvements. It is also, for me, a true leadership style that will represent what Lean and Agile is really about. We look at improvement as experiments. And by having these fixed routines that are kind of defined, basically like a script in your shoe state, when you try it over and over again, the same way, which will feel mechanically in the beginning, it is kind of a guiding rail, kind of stepping into the unknown. Because if you repeat that pattern over and over again, and that is familiar, then you can put all your energy on the things that is uh, unknown. So are the cordas, the exact cordas important? Yes, but having routines is more important. So if you find the katas described here not to be exactly what you would like, define your own katas and run them over and over again until they become muscle memory. That is more important than following exactly the points that's been described here. But it's probably a very good starting point. If you haven't tried anything like this before, try the Karas for a couple of months and you will see that there's some depth in there that you didn't realize in the beginning. If you want to learn more, here's a number of links. Uh, the slides will, of course, be available and I think the video will be available as well. Uh, at the top, you have my blog uh, with the tag uh, Toyota Kara and you will see a lot of Lego slides. Uh, and. Uh, quite a, uh, a bit of material. Uh, of course, Mike Roder's site, uh, where he has the source material. Uh, please, feel, uh, well, please feel free to go there. Uh, and I have links on my blog to the, uh, towards that as well. Uh, and with that, I will close for questions and remember to rate the session. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Well, first and probably most important one, is there a secret code to turn on those damn and I candy crush with this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's your uh, sometimes management doesn't allow us to try new things in fermentation. How do we deal with that? In general, I would say if you have a resistance to change, try to make the change as small as possible and time limited. So when I work with team, like with the Anna's team here, I would typically say uh, 
Well, let's just try something. And depending on the buy-in you have, uh, if you have a very low buy-in, try to make it as short as possible and just make one step. Because when you make one step and it's not dangerous, then you're typically allowed to take the next one. So try to make them as small as possible and time limited. Okay, and the final one. Where do you draw the line between leaders, e.g. managers going to see the actual work away from their corner office, and then being a disturbance or a scary figure for the team? This is actually quite a, um, a hard question uh, to answer. And what we did with one management team, well, actually, you need to show respect as a leader. And to do this, you need to be very safe as a leader. So we had a, a number of managers uh, do like a Gamba walk on a regular basis, visit the teams, look at their boards, asking questions about what was going on and so on. Uh, but they didn't know how to do it. So they felt awkward in that situation and therefore that kind of projected to the teams. And the teams felt that they were kind of monitored. So what we did was actually write down a script of how these managers should behave. And we added things like, when you step into the team room, the first thing you would do is to ask, is it okay if we enter the room right now? Is this an appropriate time? And if they say yes, well, then they have invited you in. If they say no, then you can ask, when would be a, an appropriate time to do this? Uh, we also made the script actually available, and we defined for each step of that script what was the intent of the question. So if they ask, so what can I see on your board? It's not about kind of controlling, it's about them trying to learn. So you're kind of being open and transparent what you want to do. Okay, we're out of time. Oh. Thank you very much, Logan. Thank you.